Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. This is the first one we're filming in our new studio. It's been an insane week, very busy, because we had the Alder Lake launch to look at, and also we moved here. So we're going to talk about both of those things, but mostly some of the Alder Lake follow-up pieces. We'll also be going over RTX 2060 updates, Y, NVIDIA, and we'll be talking about some of AMD's new GPUs for cloud-based gaming. Still a topic. Stadia tried its hardest to kill that topic, but it's back. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Asus and the ROG Crosshair 8 series of X570 motherboards for AMD. Asus has both the Crosshair 8 Hero Dark and the Crosshair 8 Extreme available, offering high-end motherboards for high core count AMD systems. We've used the Crosshair series for years for everything from basic overclocking up to liquid nitrogen overclocking, and we found them easy to work with, particularly for their extremely well-organized BIOS menus. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up, the quick GN side of things. Obviously, we're in a new studio. Alder Lake hit so fast that we didn't even get time to publish or even finish editing our moving vlogs and updates and all that stuff before we had to just start publishing things from the new set. This set came together in maybe two hours in its entirety, plus about an hour for getting this mounted. Uh, Mike and Patrick Stone on the team handled that, and, uh, and it came together great for how fast we threw it together uh, within a day we were filming again for the Alder Lake launch. So this will kind of develop as we go. The tool wall needs more tools on it. We're trying to keep it a little bit cleaner than before, but it's going to be a bit messier than it is right now. So we'll get to a middle ground. Anyway, uh, this is the new set for now. There's another table next to me. That's the live stream set. We'll do all this in a tour set of tour videos and make sure you check back for those. But uh, there's a lot of cool stuff we want to show. And um, we filmed the whole process. We filmed the final walkthrough of the old space and a uh, major milestone setting up this space. You may have seen some of the walkthroughs of this space when it was uh, in dire need of renovation, which is what's been happening over the last probably nine, eight or nine months at this point. Anyway, we're here now, so this is where we're filming, but if you saw a big change in sets one day to the next, that's why. Our plan is once Alder Lake cools down a little bit, we are going to run a bunch of videos showing the, the fun process setting up the space. You'll get to see everyone on the team uh, involved at different levels, get to see a little bit of the personality behind the channel from everybody who works on content here, and uh, it's fun. It, it's it got a great energy to it, but we've just been holding all that stuff for Alder Lake. We have a few more pieces we want to do on Alder Lake. We've got two in mind right now, and then uh, other than that, it'll slow down a little bit on the Intel side of things unless there's some major item we need to research or a company launches another silicon product. As for other quick updates, the toolkits have been flying off the shelves. They've been on back order. We have a date for them. It's on the store, on store.gamersaccess.net. We, I think it took some, I don't know, it took several months to get them in this time because the manufacturing and logistics timelines are really long right now. We ordered a massive amount of them, but they were out of stock for a long time leading up to the back order that we just put up available on the store a couple weeks ago. Anyway, the point is, if you want to make sure you get one in this coming up round, place a back order on the store. It also helps us soak some of the cost from moving. We got the fan tester in, by the way, speaking of high cost, uh, items that we need to soak with store sales. The fan tester's here. It is still in the crate. We'll insert some footage or something of that uh, in this video so you can see it. But we'll we'll do, it might be the only unboxing video we ever do. And that's because it's an eight foot long crate with uh, something like 12 or 1600 pounds or something like that of testing equipment in it. Anyway, so the toolkits are up on the store on store.gamersaccess.net. They're on back order. The date is there. If you back order, you will be guaranteed to get one in the next run. It's a 10-piece toolkit. We fine-tuned every tool in the kit, so all the rod lengths and handle lengths are matched 100 millimeters each. And we also have the hex heads that are ground down so that they'll fit flush against a PCB and uh, has a bit of extra clearance around it than typically you would have on a hex head so that you're not colliding with things like small SMDs, capacitors, things of that nature gives a little bit more room to work on a crowded PCB for something like a video card. There's also tools for multiple common Allen keys in computer building, uh, multiple Phillips head sizes, and the roll bag is extremely convenient. They're also high quality tools that we've spent a long time on. We've gone through several runs of these now, uh, very popular. So thank you to everyone who's bought them, who's supported us, and who's made it possible for us to get into this space because really the store was a large part of making this happen. Okay, first news item is about the Windows power plans and the core arrangement or assignment of tasks to the E cores and P cores on Intel Alder Lake. This is something that we just wanted to include in this video because it didn't have a place anywhere else. But much of 
the Alder Lake onboard Intel thread director discussion happened leading up to the launch. And then at launch, it just kind of, at least in our coverage, fizzled as we shifted instead from focusing on technology to focusing on how does it actually perform in real life. Intel had stated that the thread director technology would, quote, make the optimal scheduling decision for any workload or workflow. And in its presentation at Hot Chips in August, the slide stated, quote, background threads of any class are directed to energy efficient cores and priority threads are directed to performance cores. So regardless of whether a high priority thread gets pushed off to a P core or to an E core, the uh, difference is that it gets the higher voltage frequency than a lower priority thread would get. This is something that we thought was interesting to uh, dig into a little bit further following the reviews and, and talk more about what Intel's trying to do here. Intel's official recommendation for the Alder Lake CPUs was to use Windows 11, that's for retail and for testing, uh, and it's designed around the hybrid architecture and thread director specifically. From the Alder Lake keynote, quote, using OS hybrid optimization along with thread director feedback, background activities may be efficiently offloaded to E cores, unlocking massive performance and responsiveness of P cores. Now, the reason we're quoting so frequently here is because it's important as we try to re-emphasize the point that Windows 11 versus Windows 10, it's not necessarily expected to be a big performance jump. And we showed in our testing, it generally is not a big change between the two. Uh, it's possible that there can be a big change under certain parameters, but the way we tested it, there was not. And that's expected because, and Intel expects this too, and so does Microsoft, because what it's actually doing, all this all thread director and the P-Core and E-Core assignment of tasks, is it's trying to improve the multitasking efficacy on the processor rather than the raw performance. So if you're doing something that is raw performance focused, you won't see much of a change, if any at all, in how threads are prioritized and assigned. Whereas if you're doing something that's more complicated with uh, multiple relatively high demand loads running simultaneously, relatively meaning more than maybe just like a notepad window open and more than just a, a single Chrome tab open, things like that then you'll start to see the differences emerge in theory more in Windows 11. At least that's the theory. That's how it's supposed to work. And to be clear, multitasking, it, it really, it means more than like you use Discord while you play games or you watch uh, a single YouTube video high <laughs> while you play games. Um, it, it's, it's more of you, maybe you use Discord, you're on a video call or uh, perhaps streaming and or you've got a video running while you're running maybe a little bit of some light compression or decompression workloads while you're playing a game or while uh, you're running some sort of code compile, something like that. A little bit more intensive than just something that kind of sits there like Discord would do with relatively low thread engagement, at least if it's just a chat window. One further wrench, though, that's thrown into the works with testing specifically is that Windows 11 places higher priority on foreground apps. So here's another quote. We've done a lot of work in memory management in favor of the app windows you have running in the foreground so that they're prioritized with more CPU and other system resources, end quote. That in itself isn't new, but Anantac's coverage of the Alder Lake press briefing reported that with the Windows 11 balanced power plan enabled, threads would be run on E cores or P cores based directly on the foreground window in a non-intelligent way, potentially overriding the Intel thread director suggestions. And that's not non-intelligent in the insulting sense, although certainly it could be used that way, but rather in the technical computer sense of it just sort of does the thing. This all sounds like an extension of the existing Microsoft quality of service policy that intentionally throttles background applications, but Microsoft made the E versus P core choice sound more subtle and intelligent prior to Alder Lake's launch. Quote, instead of just knowing whether an application is in the foreground or whether the application developer has set, and this is the important part that you need to listen to, has set Eco QoS, the system can make sure threads with higher performance requirements are assigned to performance cores or P cores. Uh, end quote. Intel expressed something similar, saying, quote, schedulers typically work with limited information, like whether an application is running in the foreground or the background. Our performance monitoring unit can access much more from the hardware, including the instruction mix, the state of individual cores, and other relevant telemetry. So if the end result of all this, the reason we're bringing this up, if the end result of all this is really as simple as <laughs> a front window get good core, then it takes the wind out of a lot of those earlier claims or focus or marketing, what have you. Regardless, we've been doing all of our CPU testing with the Windows 
high performance power plant used for years. Uh, there's a lot of reasons we've stated over the years for this, but it's very consistent, it's predictable, uh, it produces good data, so you're not as at risk of potentially jeopardizing a data set, um, which we've seen in the past. We've had to wipe data because of other power plans screwing around with things in the past. So that's why we use it. And as long as you know it's consistent, that's really the important part. And as long as everyone understands what it is, that's the important part. But anyway, uh, using balance is completely valid as long as people tell you it is and if they pay close attention to their data sets to make sure they're all clean. And we just didn't want that extra overhead because it had complicated things in the past. Uh, so ever since the last time the balanced plan got screwy, we have been focused on using high performance. Some quick and dirty testing with Cinebench single-threaded benchmarking suggests that the workload does indeed move between E cores and P cores, uh, depending on the focused window, but we need to do further testing to validate this. Uh, it was something, however, we were interested in and wanted to share with you at least briefly in a news video, and then we'll try to do something with this in a future follow-up piece. So as always, check back for that. If you're interested in more of the uh, now we're getting into the technology research aspect of the review where the product reviews up, you know, the details, how it performs, and now we're more of just exploring how does this thing work, and it's kind of cool to do that, so check back. All right, next story, RTX 2060 SKUs getting a revival. Yes, yes, this is happening. So we had a source tell us recently, one of the system integrators was talking with us and noted that the RTX 2060 is in fact coming back, uh, and uh, it's coming back in a weird SKU. It's coming back with a 12 gigabyte model from what we understand now. Our immediate response to 12 gigabytes was simply, why? Why? What can it, how, is, is an RTX 2060 ever going to use 12 gigabytes? At least reasonably and in what it's targeted at, which is gaming. The answer is probably not really. It might show up that way in Task Manager or GPU-Z, but uh, that's going to be an issue of allocation rather than utilization. And so 12 gigabytes is sort of wasted here, but our thinking of why this is happening, if NVIDIA does in fact end up going through with this decision to make a 2060 12 gigabyte, is probably NVIDIA needs to, it may one, recognize that there's an opening in the market for more GPUs, especially of this caliber. Uh, it may recognize that it can make some additional money by spinning up an older process and, and manufacturing something that does not pull away from the existing pool it has of silicon, of wafer supply agreements for its RTX 30 series GPUs on newer technology, newer process technology. And then three, they may be going with the 12 gigabyte solution rather than something more appropriately sized like the original 2060 SKUs because it, maybe it's, it's probably part marketing, it's also probably part NVIDIA doesn't want to sort of admit defeat and say, yes, we've had to pull this GPU up out of the grave to help alleviate the current supply constraints because we just we can't do it otherwise. And so to make it look like it's fresh and new, they're increasing the memory capacity in a way which is ultimately probably pretty pointless, at least for a GPU of this caliber. And remember that memory capacity is only useful if the rest of the hardware is fast enough to saturate that memory capacity. And in this case, uh, probably not really, but we'll see. We'll test it. Uh, the, the word right now on the street in the industry is that this is coming out. We don't know when. We don't have a date. Uh, I think maybe some of the rumor mills have speculated as to it, but we weren't able to confirm with anybody directly ourselves. So at this point, suffice to say, a 2060 higher capacity SKU is inbound. Uh, we just don't know when specifically. It should be within the next couple months, though, if it's already something on our radar. We also heard word of 30 Ti SKUs getting refreshes with more memory capacity as well. The 3080 specifically uh, is on the list of things to get refreshed with more memory, so keep an eye out for all of that. And otherwise, that's kind of all there is on the GPU front right now. Via sells part of Centaur technology to Intel for $125 million. In the world of x86 designs, there are really only three players. There's Intel and AMD, and then the one everyone forgets about. Uh, and that is basically Centaur technology. Intel and AMD are, they cross license x86 and x64. Only a couple companies in the world have an x86 license to even make products that use x86 uh, as a basis. And Intel and AMD are well known in the CPU landscape, but Centaur technology, maybe you recognize it from our channel if you saw our Jiaoxin CPU review, but otherwise it may be somewhat unfamiliar. So this company has spent most of its existence as a subsidiary of VIA, VIA being an old a CPU manufacturer as well. That's basically been defeated at this point. But it's been around since the 
uh, dabbling in, in x86 since probably about the 1990s at this point. And its designs have never really seen the same widespread adoption, obviously, as Intel and AMD, but they've been out there. The closest we've seen recently to a widespread usage is that Zhaoxin CPU that we reviewed, which is a, uh, a Chinese CPU that uses x86. So that was why it was pretty interesting. All that is to say that news recently broke of a $125 million deal that was struck between VIA and Intel to acquire something related to Centaur technology. At this point, all we really know is that Intel will recruit some of Centaur's engineering and development talent. While it isn't altogether surprising to see Intel make a consolidation move for Centaur, Intel actually bought development assets from VIA back in 2015, for example. It is something that we weren't expecting to see right now. This isn't a flat out sale of Centaur technology as far as we know. VIA and Centaur will retain an x86 license as well from what we know right now, and they will also retain the right to develop and sell x86 IP. There's also no mention of assets, patents, or IP changing hands, although we have to imagine that for $125 million, Intel gets something more than a recruitment opportunity, but neither company has disclosed the details at this time. Intel did confirm the deal to press. It confirmed it to Anantech, for example, which originally spotted the news as far as we could tell, uh, but it didn't provide any details beyond that. Interestingly, Centaur Technologies website has been taken down with a vague under construction message now appearing on the landing page. And for some history, Centaur was born in 95 under the banner of IDT and was initially formed to develop x86 designs to compete with Intel's offerings at the time. Centaur was snatched up by VIA in 1999 and has remained under VIA's roof ever since. Centaur has a number of x86 designs, such as the VIA C3, C7, and the VIA Nano, the latter of which would go on to be a fundamental part of the joint venture between VIA and Zhaoxing. As for its most recent offering, uh, Centaur hasn't stopped making things. It's, it's remained uh, active, and the most recent was the x86 CNS core, which is in its enterprise server group of offerings. Uh, as a server class core. Up next, AMD announces its new Radeon Pro GPU. This is the V620. It is targeted for cloud workloads and for online game streaming. So this is something of a surprise move. It came out of nowhere. AMD rolled out the V620 RDNA 2 architecture GPU. And these new V620 is aimed at virtualization specifically. And AMD is explicitly citing cloud gaming and, quote, immersive AAA experiences as its primary usage for the V620. And he also envisions the GPU usable for 3D workloads, 3D uh, design and software, visual compute, machine learning, office productivity and development environments, and uh, referenced DAAS or desktop as a service. That's a terrifying phrase to read. Or uh, WAAS, which is a workspace as a service. You thought, uh, you, you thought not owning any software was suboptimal, where you pay Adobe or Microsoft a fee for eternity for access to word processing, spreadsheet, or video editing software. Wait till you pay monthly to use a computer. That's where we're going. But uh, the Radeon Pro V, it, it actually probably is where we're going. Oh, that'll be fun. The Radeon Pro V620 will ship with features that are germane to RDNA 2 and also of a GPU that's aimed at virtualization in the cloud. Such features include AMD's Infinity Cache, hardware-based ray tracing, so this is stuff that's been around, AMD Fidelity FX, GPU partitioning, that's the interesting one for this, and support for both DirectX and Vulkan APIs. As a standard for GPU sharing, the card will also support SRIOV-based sharing technology to protect data and traffic between users sharing PCIe devices. Hardware-wise, the Radeon Pro V620 offers 4608 stream processors and 72 compute units. That's in addition to 32 gigabytes of GDDR6 ECC memory, operating at 16 gigabits per second with a memory bandwidth of 512 gigabytes per second over a 256-bit memory bus. The GPU has a board power of 300 watts claimed and uses one PCIe by 16 slot. AMD noted that the Radeon Pro V620 is available immediately, although this one is obviously only for data center customers and for public cloud offerings. With Intel Alder Lake came the first widespread PCIe Gen 5 deployment, and it's obsolete. It's gone. PCIe Gen 6 is getting ready. Uh, PCI SIG recently published the final draft. We talked about this previously. Uh, version 0.9 ratified and ready for the PCIe Gen 6 specification. And Cadence is the first company out the gate with some test silicon and IP based on the emergent PCIe Gen 6 interface. Now, a quick reminder here, 
the interface always develops faster than the products that get deployed with the interface. So you'll always end up at least one generation in the future with what's technically ready versus what's actually deployed. So it's not abnormal to see uh, something like PCIe Gen 5 rolling out as the new one is more or less getting ready to go. Although it it's, does feel like it's a little bit more compressed this time than normally condensed closer to each other. But uh, PCIe has been marching ahead with the extremely difficult choice of should we double the uh, maximum theoretical speed this generation? Yes, and then they do it. Cadence is offering IP for PCIe Gen 6 DSP-based PHY and controllers, as well as 5 nanometer test chip silicon built on TSMC's N5 note. Cadence notes that its PCIe 6.0 test silicon delivered optimal electrical performance, spanning all PCIe data rates, and that the PAM4 NRZ dual mode transmitter maintained optimal signal integrity with low jitter. The test chip will allow customers to test signal integrity and jitter in their own PCIe Gen 6 compatible products in the future. So this might be something like a GPU, for example, in the future. The IP package offered by Cadence is also based on TSMC's N5 node and will allow vendors to add uh, or test support for a number of PCIe Gen 6 products, such as SSDs, ASICs, GPUs, etc. And Cadence, I haven't followed too closely since I had to work with them a little bit back around the 2010 to 11 timeline uh, as part of a, a different job. But uh, at least at that time, Cadence focused on things like signal integrity analysis, crosstalk, impedance analysis, things of that nature, and providing products to companies that sell maybe consumer or other products to analyze the crosstalk, the impedance, signal integrity of their electrical uh, components. EVGA reporting a truckload of stolen 30 series GPUs. That must have been an interesting one to report to the police in Southern California. EVGA reported that someone or multiple someones has stolen a literal truckload of the company's RTX 30 series cards. That's right, we're in dystopia now, it's happening. The theft occurred somewhere in California as the truck was on the way to EVGA's distribution center in Southern California as per EVGA's post on the company's forums. Quote, please take notice that on October 29th, 2021, a shipment of EVGA RTX 30 series graphics cards was stolen from a truck en route to San Francisco to our Southern California distribution center. These graphics cards are in high demand and each has an estimated retail value starting at $330 up to $2,000 MSRP, reads the post. Now, if I could get the help of our editors, hopefully Keegan can can knock this one out in a way that's useful for identifying who we think the thief might be. But our guess is that one Mr. Jay's Two Cents, first name Jay's, last name Two Cents, has tried to reenact the Fast and the Furious with his very fast cars and stole the truckload of GPUs. I believe his accomplice was Phil. If we could just get that on the screen so everyone can identify them as the thieves, that would be great. And hopefully, if you if you know either of these two individuals, be sure to notify EVJ immediately that there's a truckload of GPUs at Mr. Jay's Two Cents' warehouse. I mean, think about it realistically. Jay recently posted a video walking through a micro center where there were lots of GPUs on the on those shelves in the background. Do you think those just appeared there? Do you think Micro Center bought those from a legitimate source? No. Of course, Jay hijacked a truck and then drove them to Micro Center and sold it to them on the gray market, and that makes sense. So anyway, leave a comment on Jay's channel and tell him that we've caught him. We figured out it was him. Uh, EVJ omitted any details regarding specific models. The $330 to $1960 price range pretty much covers literally everything in the RTX 30 series. Furthermore, EVJ's post notes that warranty and claims will not be honored on these stolen cards. What? Why? And that the cards cannot be registered, unsurprisingly. EVJ, no doubt, is in possession of serial numbers and lot codes, so it shouldn't be hard for them to identify a stolen card should it surface somewhere. Sort of like looking for a VIN on your car or something. The global shortage and insatiable demand for GPUs and other silicon has paved the way for criminals and bot scripts to capitalize on any inventory that can be found and in turn scalp it for well above MSRP. No doubt that's what's happening here. And uh, I guess, I don't know, it boils down to sucks to be you if you buy one of these on eBay by accident, not knowing it was stolen and end up unable to service it or warranty it. Although we'll, we'll see if they bend on their plans. ASUS, Thor 2 power supplies to make use of the new PCIe Gen 5 12-pin connector. More vendors here are likely to follow as well. Uh, ASUS recently announced its new line of ROG Thor 2 power supplies. And along that announcement, interestingly enough, it has shown its 12-pin PCIe connector, one that looks a lot like NVIDIA's 12-pin connector that it pushed so hard for. 
and that ultimately ended up only on its Founders Edition models. Now, this is something that's been in the PCIe spec for a long time, since before NVIDIA launched its Founders Edition card, so it's not really surprising here. But according to ASUS, NVIDIA's 12-pin connector is, in fact, PCIe Gen 5 compliant. This coincides with recent news of a new 12VH power connector for spotted by Igor from Igor's lab. This connector has an additional four signal and sense contacts at the bottom of the connector beneath the power pins, and the connector being shown by ASUS doesn't have these four pins, so they appear to be optional, and our understanding is that they are. The 12VH power shows 12 pins in the body of the connector itself with a reported 9.2 amps per pin. According to ASUS marketing, the new 12-pin cable is capable of delivering up to 600 watts, which again aligns with what we know about the power connector. That's quite a bit more than what can be achieved with three 150-watt rated PCIe 8-pin connectors plus the 75-watt PCIe slot total, although the 12-volt there is 66 watts. Now, this is an attempt to consolidate the uh, pin requirement, the power cable requirement on video cards where you've seen three or sometimes four 8-pin uh, connectors on one card and bring it down into a, a more simplified connector that can handle more power. So that's where it's going for this. Uh, there's only so many 8-pin connectors you can reasonably fit anyway. Valve delays at the Steam Deck until insert date here. We're not sure yet. Valve announced that the Steam Deck will now be delayed until at least February. But again, Valve's known for delays. Uh, the post from the Steam Deck store page reads, more like Valve isn't sure when delivery will actually happen, so don't be surprised if it's pushed back again. Valve cited, quote, material shortages and delays without getting specific. Reservation queues remain in the same order, and everyone gets shifted back to the new timeline. New estimated order availability timeframes can be checked on the product page. Up next, NVIDIA Omniverse has its new avatar solution. Uh, NVIDIA demoed an animated toy avatar of CEO Jensen Huang. We're waiting for the DLC pack with Lisa Su so that you can put them in a Street Fighter style ring and make them fight against each other. Uh, this is using the Omniverse animation systems. The video, which is available on NVIDIA's YouTube channel, shows Toy Jensen answering domain-specific questions to subject matter experts in real time. The point of the demonstration was to show that we're getting closer to developing a Jarvis-like service and reference AI that can help answer questions for customer service, daily tasks, and research. Clearly, no development is needed uh, in the line of AI customer service because one of my personal recent experiences was contacting customer service, getting a chat bot. The bot asking, was this helpful? I typed no, N-O, and it replied, thank you, have a nice day, and ended the session. So everything seems to be working great. I wasn't mad at all from that experience. And uh, definitely, I will be using that company again immediately in the near future. This iteration of the AI is from Project Tokyo, or Tokyo. It's talking kiosk is what it comes out to. And that combines elements of NVIDIA technologies, Omniverse, Maxine, Riva, and Megatron uh, Turing NLG 530B large language models. The Omniverse platform was used to build the surrounding scenes and create the facial and body animations based on the audio source. The Maxine SDK was used to make it photorealistic. NVIDIA Riva was used for speech AI. And Megatron Turing NLG 530B large language model was implemented for natural language understanding. There is a future here for licensing out the service of AI customer service bots to be things like reskinnable baby Yodas or something like that to answer your medical or astrophysics questions in the future. But for now, leather jacket toy Jensen Huan will have to do. And hopefully the Lisa Sue DLC comes out soon because I kind of do want to see the battle. Last one, Noctua recently announces a foam stack. That's right. You thought Noctua couldn't innovate any further. Well, now the company has introduced foam. You may not have heard it. It's a somewhat squishy um, material that sits, in this case, between the CPU and the side panel of a case. And uh, you can stack it. And that's the extent of the product. Yes, really. The new compact air coolers, the NHL9i17 and Chromax Black Edition, uh, and the groundbreaking new foam stack technology, the NAFD1, is literally a combination of the cooler and then a stack of seven foam spacers that can be combined in various height arrangements to create an air duct between a Noctua cooler and a case panel. In the installation guide video, Noctua claims a six degrees Celsius temperature improvement in two specific cases by adding the foam stack, sorry, fan duct, they call it, Perhaps we'll get one of these in to test it and see if we can re reproduce the results. It does actually make sense that you'd be able to get a benefit here by uh, funneling air straight in. And it's, it's sort of 
focuses the pressure of the fan on the CPU cooler if the panel isn't too far away. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to back order the toolkits, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We've just published the behind the scenes video with Patrick Stone doing some server maintenance in our new office. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.